Okay, now we're going to move forward a little bit and get into the nuts and bolts of macro photography because it is not all a bed of roses. There are a lot of challenges to shooting macro, primarily shallow depth of field. We're going to discuss that in a minute, but it's in stark contrast to landscape photography, which has a great depth of field. The other challenge is handshake. No, not shaking hands, but your hands shaking while you're trying to hold the camera when you're dealing with very, very tiny objects. And finally, limited available light. Again, in stark contrast to landscape photography or even uh, portrait photography, where you step back from the subject quite a bit uh, and let all the light in, macro photography, you come right up on a subject and you limit the available light, which causes you to have to decrease your shutter speed or increase your ISO, etc. So let's deal with each of these in turn and start with shallow depth of field. Shallow depth of field can be overcome in basically three different ways. The first is by decreasing the f-stop or aperture. The aperture is the adjustment of how much light you want, to lend, you want the lens to allow in. Every time you hit the shutter, your aperture opens and closes not only fast, which is the shutter speed, you, just, you control how fast it opens, but the aperture or f-stop controls how wide it opens. Does it open all the way up and let as much light as possible or does it open just a little bit and let a limited amount of light in? Okay. The second way in which we can deal with a shallow depth of field is to get your plane of focus true. In other words, and I'll explain this in a minute, if you get exactly perpendicular to your subject, like for instance a hundred dollar bill, if I take from one end of the bill to the other, I create a depth of field. One end of the bill is facing me, the other end is away from me, so I'm going to have front and background and a middle ground that's in focus. Whereas if I stand directly over the hundred dollar bill, the entirety of the bill is exactly in the same planes with my lens, so I get the plane of focus true. Same thing would be a butterfly. If I get directly over the butterfly, I have a true plane of focus, and I'll show what that means. And finally, image stacking. Image stacking is probably the greatest advent of modern macro photography that's come about and there's a lot of software products that help you stack your images and what that means is basically you take let's say 5, 10, even 15 or more shots of the same subject at different focus points the front of it, the middle, the back, you take various uh, individual shots of the subject all over the subject and then you combine all these images into one image where every point of it is in focus and that's what's called a stack where the entire subject is in focus because you've taken several photographs of it and combined it into one image. So let's discuss each of these in turn. Okay, controlling the f-stop. f2.8 is a very shallow depth of focus or depth of field and it gives a creamy bokeh. Well what does that mean? A shallow depth of field, uh, f2.8 is actually letting in the most light your lens can let in. Some lenses are even f1.4, but most are f2.8. Um, and what it does is it allows a lot of light in, but the, the more light you let in, the narrower and narrower your depth of field is going to be. That's the bad news. The good news is what becomes out of focus creates what's called a bokeh. And Boca is a critical word for macro photographers, particularly artistic macro photographers, and I'll explain and show examples of this as we proceed. Don't worry, there's pictures coming, so it's not all just uh, uh, letters and words. Okay, F16, if we stop down to F16, you get a much greater depth of field, but almost no bokeh. When you stop down to F16, you're letting much less light in. Now you notice that f16 seems to be a bigger number than f2.8, so you're wondering how in the world do I stop down to 16 from 2.8? Well, it has to do with the amount of light you're letting in. You're actually letting in less light, so they call it stopping down to f16. So <coughs> I'll show examples um, of how this affects right now. Uh, well, maybe not right now. Let me t say one more thing. It's up to you as the photographer to decide what is needed to enhance your goal f2.8 is going to be very artistic but it's not very useful for scientific purposes f16 is going to have a lot of your subject in focus but the foreground and background aren't going to be a smooth creamy bokeh they're going to be kind of rendered 
badly and there's going to be a lot of distracting noise. So let's show examples of this as we proceed. Let's take this $100 bill as an example. You'll notice it's taken at f2.8. f2.8, I've, I've focused right here at the center point and as my foreground gets further and further away from the center point you'll notice it gets blurrier and blurrier. This is what we would call a bokeh, this creamy rendering of the out of focus elements. Same thing with the background, the further and further away from the center of Ben Franklin's face I get the blurrier and blurrier we go. Now let's stop down to F10. You'll notice at the same center point it's in focus but more and more of it remains in focus the further back we go and the further in the foreground we go. F20 is the same thing and now pretty much the entire bill is in focus. Okay. So let's show an example again. We'll go real close. This is f2.8 now. This is all in focus here. But the, right away, it's starting to get blurry. And so you can see, if I'm taking a, a shot of a small object, it's, a lot of it's going to be blurry with just one shot at f2.8. If I stop down to f10, more of my subject is going to be in focus. If I stop down to f20, the entire thing is in focus. So just to hammer a point home, let's show again the foreground. This is the foreground at f2.8. Almost, it's not in focus. It looks like it's underwater. At f10, it's more in focus, but it's still blurry, which, you know, if you're trying to take a picture of a, an animal, a lot of it's going to be out of focus. And then f20, the whole thing is in focus, and this is still from the center point being the point of focus. So you might be wondering why in the world we wouldn't just take all macro shots at f20. Well, there are some reasons. One is diffraction. The higher, uh, the more you expand the image, the more diffraction you're going to see, as well as the fact it renders the background badly if you really don't need the background in your image. So let's show some examples. F2.8. Here I've taken a photograph of a cypress vine flower. This is the plane of focus here. We mentioned that as another element. Pretty much all of this is in focus. But the, immediately as we go back behind the flower, it's out of focus. That's bad news in some way, but in other ways, this is a beautiful bokeh right here. This is what I meant by the smooth, creamy bokeh when you use an F2.8. This is actually all sticks and weeds and branches and grass and things like that. And it's rendered completely out of focus so that I can concentrate on this beautiful flower. And this is what artistic macro photographers like to see. If I take an, a, a different image, let's say at f10, this would be an example where I, as the uh, photographer, wanted to have some of this in focus. I wanted some of the uh, environment in focus along with the lizard, and then as we get progressively back farther, it becomes uh, blurry, and that's just the way it is. Now, if I stop down to f20 as an example for this uh, passion flower, all of the passion flowers in focus, I've even used a flash here, but you can see what I mean by the background. It's no longer a creamy bokeh. You see the trees here, or the leaves here. You see the dirt here. I mean, all of this stuff really has nothing to do with the image. So if I'm taking an artistic shot, yeah, the flower's pretty, and the, and the colors are pretty, but gosh, look at all the garbage in the background that kind of takes away from the image. So if I'm just trying to take a scientific shot, I might not care, but when you're dealing with artistic macros, you're going to want to make use of uh, bokeh. And we'll show more examples of this. Now, the other way to deal with the shallow depth of field has been kind of mentioned, and that's a true plane of focus. Let's go back to the $100 bill we mentioned earlier. Rather than taking my photograph from an angle where I have a foreground at one part of the bill, a middle ground at the center of the bill, and a background at the end of the bill, I just get directly over the bill. And now I have a true plane of focus. And even though this is f2.8, which you saw how quickly everything got out, uh, gets out of focus, now everything's in focus. And the reason is I've got a true plane of focus. So let's see how this translates to nature shots. Okay, well, this is actually a bad example. Here we go, bad example. I've I'm, I'm got a lot of things going on wrong in this picture. I've done a couple of things here. I, I so try to get a true plane of focus. I get to the side of this butterfly. But I'm using a really wide f-stop. I'm using, a, I mean, not a wide, I stop down, I think, f-16. I see this, this blurry thing in my way, in the foreground. I see the hose in the background, some dirt and other objects in the background that just really clutter up the image. Not the least of which, my lighting is terrible here. And we'll get into lighting later. 
but the butterfly's wing is coming out at me. So it's not really a true plane of focus, just everything is wrong with this image. So let's see an example where everything's right. Here's the same exact species of butterfly. This time, I get him in the shade so my lighting is better. His wings are completely closed, and I've stopped down to about f4.5. This renders my background completely blurry. This is the beautiful bokeh that I'm talking about. Just nothing to distract from this image. All you see is the beautiful wings that are in a true plane of focus, the body's in a true plane of focus, even the stem of this flower that he's on is in focus. So by doing this, I can use a very high f-stop at f4.5, still have everything in focus, and yet render the background blurry and beautiful. Here's another example. <clears throat> I've, I've, I think this is f5.6 here, but I'm at a slight angle much like the original hundred dollar bill shot I've got this part out of focus I'm getting more and more in focus here and as I go to a background I've got more and more of it blurry the further out I go because I do not have a true plane of focus here by adjusting my angle just a little bit I now have a true plane of focus and almost the entire butterfly now is in focus <coughs> finally uh, the last way to, dis uh, to deal with um, a shallow depth of field is image stacking, which is perhaps the best way. Let's show an example of how this works. This subject here is impossible to get a true plane of focus on. I can't do that. So I really don't want to get uh, stop down to f16 or f20 because I'm going to see a bunch of garbage back here. I am actually, this is not a studio shot. This is, I was standing in the middle of a swamp, pumpkin swamp to be exact, about up to my knees and I wanted to get a beautiful artistic rendering of this shot and uh, have this creamy bokeh but yet look how much of this is blurry I, I, because I've got different depths of field I mean it's so far away from each other there's no way to get it all in focus with one shot so what do I do I take photographs of this of this of this same exact sh tripod shot I don't move my camera at all I take pictures of every little piece and boom I combine them into one image through software and now I've got every little detail and focus here and yet I've still got my creamy background. I don't stop down to f16 because I don't want to see a bunch of distracting elements. Sure it starts to get blurry the way the farther back it goes here. I mean I could have continued to take pictures of here, of here, of here and continue to be in focus but that's overkill and really I kinda of like the dreamy entrance right here. So by combining several images and stacking them into one image I overcome the problem of uh, depth of field and yet I still retain my bokeh. Here's another example. This subject here I can't get one shot of him. Um, I suppose I could use F20 but then I'm gonna see my lawn back here. I'm gonna see uh, not my lawn but uh, nature back here and that's because his uh, the abdomen of this spider sticks out towards me. This is away from me. This egg sac is towards me. This is away from me. So what do I do? I take different focus points on down through the spider, through the legs, I combine them all into one image, and I've got most of them in focus. This is still a little blurry here. I could have gone on, but that's fine. Uh, and that's how image stacking works. Final example. This is a moth. It's an imperial moth. Unlike butterflies that tend to be flat, moths are thicker and they're huskier. Even though I'm in focus here with one shot, as his wings dip down away from me, they get blurrier they get blurrier as his head goes away from me and dips down blurrier same with the abdomen here I don't want a bunch of stuff in the background so I don't want to stop down to f16 f20 I want to keep this nice so I I retain an f5.6 which is a good low uh, f-stop to use uh, lets in a lot of light but not too much and I take about 12 different images and boom I combine them into one image and my entire subject is in focus but I still have a blurry background. I leave the stick out of focus. I could have made it, I could have kept going all the way down here and kept this in focus, but I didn't really see the need to. So that'll, uh, that'll uh, finalize uh, one, of the, or one of the biggest challenges to macro photography. So we'll move on to the next one, and that's dealing with hand shake. The most common way people do is they, they brace themselves against something. Another way to overcome handshake is to use a flash. Using a flash allows you to uh, increase your 
shutter speed to f250 or whatever and what that does is it stops the action boom quickly like that so whatever shaking you do do it's it's minimized by the fact uh, your shutter opens and closes so fast and also there are some lenses that come with image stabilization and uh, that can help in a lot of regular photography it's a little dubious for macro photography though uh, to be honest but it can help a little or in my judgment this is the way to deal with handshake and you simply don't use your hands you don't hand hold your camera you use a tripod and use a remote switch it's as simple as this you will never hold your camera as steady in your hands as a tripod will hold it for you period with macro photography you shaking just a little bit just even a sixteenth of an inch is like jumping up and down taking a picture of a person just picture a small animal that is maybe a quarter of an inch big just the slightest movement is causing blur if you use a tripod you get your focus you let go of the camera and you use a remote switch there's no movement to your camera uh, even the action of depressing your shutter with your finger can cause movement and that's why most macro shooters use a remote switch so let's see how to deal with handshake in the field there's me trying to deal with handshake in three different ways I'm bracing myself my elbows against my knees I am using a special macro twin light flash and I'm also using a Canon uh, F100L which has image stabilization and this is what I'm taking a picture of is this little bitty flower right here a toad flax so what does that look like boom now can anyone see the difference in this photograph from all my other photographs that difference is I've got a completely black background and that is one of the troubles with using a flash if you don't have uh, reflectors or several flashes lighting up your background it turns jet black which most macro photographers don't like to see sometimes it can be good most often it's frowned upon um, here's another example I'm hand holding this time I'm not really bracing against everything but I've got an image stabilization I've got flash and boom I take this picture again the flash kinda helps pop some of these colors out of the butterfly but because I have a, an f-stop of like f-16, I'm seeing the garbage in the background. I don't have a creamy bokeh that's ruined, whatever this is behind a stick or whatnot. It's really not good form, I don't think. And I'll show you another picture of this butterfly that's uh, just really, really nice. But uh, you can try to overcome handshake in this way. Or my suggestion is simply put your camera on a tripod and use a remote switch. Here I am. Uh, adjusting I'm taking a picture of this mushroom here I'm adjusting my my focus with a 180 millimeter lens I let go of the lens I'm not using the shutter with my hand I use a remote switch and it's absolute stability here's me again it's raining a little bit you can see the water drops another thing and this is really a key for you macro shooters another thing I'm able to do with a tripod is use my live view <coughs> I can instead of looking at them through my uh, viewfinder which I have to do if I hand hold I'm able to step back and look at this and, and punch this and blow it up ten times the size and really really micro focus let go of my camera and use the remote switch so you know the final challenge is dealing with uh, limited available light you deal with it in the same way you either got to use a flash or you get your camera on a tripod you drop your shutter speed you can raise your ISO if you like. I try not to. I'd rather drop the shutter speed. And use a remote switch. And those are the ways you come, uh, you deal with the challenges of macro photography. And really, there are whole workshops devoted to that. And I have a whole workshop on that. But this is just an overview to get you thinking. So I hope this has been instructional. Thank you.